fitted than they were five years ago, 10 years ago. Business is changing, we're changing. The key is how do we as leaders lead our team? I just want to talk to you guys today about, about leading leaders and what that looks like. So if you were to look at, at, at this slide here, 2005, this is the Vatican. All right, picture looks familiar. Same place, same spot, think of the 2013. A little bit different there. This person here, flip phone. Today, so it's technology entering the world. And here's the thing too that's happening. Is everybody, a lot of businesses are trying to take technology and make technology their customer experience. And we believe that at, at the end of the day, do you have to have managers and coaches who can lead your team? But more importantly, what's that frontline employee? How are they communicating and how are they creating relationships with their clients? That's really what we wanna talk about today. Because think about it too. As Albert Einstein says, the significant problems we face today cannot be saved and solved by the level that, can be, that got us there. So we've got to really take a look at how do we solve the problem we're faced with today? So anybody here, anybody like to do any retail shopping? Yeah. What companies are really well known for great customer service in retail? Nordstrom. Nordstrom. So I, I started my career at Nordstrom. <laughs> <laughs> well, shoes. Started my career there. All right, over in South of London, take, take San Diego. But I wasn't very good at sales. I was actually put on a PIP. Anybody know what a PIP is? <laughs> Ron, you've been there before, have you? <laughs> it's a personal improvement fund. Did anybody put you on that because you're killing it? <laughs> or is that part two of uno dos adios? Or one, two barbecue? <laughs> All right, so I was on a PIP, but they have what they call a second assistant manager job open up. So I worked my tail off for like three weeks, got myself off of my PIP. And I got myself hired as a second assistant. I worked my way up from a second assistant to a first assistant to a manager and then to a buyer. Spent 11 years at Nordstrom really understanding what does that client experience look like. Then I left Nordstrom and started selling real estate down in San Diego. I thought this will be great. When I had the gift of gab, those are my initials and my obvious good looks, that people would buy from me. So there I am working my tail off. I'm there 11 months. I'm coming in early. I'm staying late. And my boss is, hey, can I have a real quick I'm not sure what's up. He doesn't know what's here. I love your enthusiasm. I love your work ethic. But I have a look at the sales results. I only sold one house in the last 11 months. I'm sorry, it's just not working out. Turns around and hands me a cardboard box. So I'm like, okay, no worries. I got a job selling corporate annual photography. I thought this will be great. I'll come in early, I'll stay late. I got the gift of and my obvious. They buy from me. So I, I'm there working my tail off. And my boss comes and says, hey, I got a real quick I'm like, sure, what's up? He says, you know what? I love your enthusiasm. I love your work ethic. But I've been looking at the sales results, and I'm sorry, it's just not working out. He lets me go. And you know what? Right behind him, he has me another card in the box. So I'm like, okay, no worries. I dropped something I would. I thought this would be fantastic. I'll be talking about the ball, just politicians, the pump, just again, they will buy for me because of mine. Yeah. And so there I was, 13 months. I just got married. My wife was really excited. I kept the job for over a year. <laughs> <laughs> November 30th, I remember it well. My boss says, hey, G.A., can I see my office real quick? I walk in the office. What's right behind me, folks? And so, I'm, anybody here ever, ever have a paper app? How old were you guys when you had paper apps? 12, 13. True story, folks, I was 28 years old. It's my life story here. They're laughing at my life story here. I was 28 and I had to get a paper app. Why? Because I had no process. I was simply winging it. And that's when I started studying what do top performers do <laughs> and how do they start creating results. What we've done is they almost always have a process. This right here is the international sign for process. What's this over here? Wax off. Wax off. Wax off. What's this right here? Wax no, wax on this way. It's all, about, it's all about having the right process in place that allows you to take the variable of the customer, put it into your process, and come up with a predictable conclusion. That's really what I want to share with you. But what we started to do is start studying what do top performing managers, leaders and sales and customer service people do. Did about 6,000 interviews over a four year period. Ended up writing a best selling book called Silver Bullet Selling. And it's really six critical steps to opening up more relationships. That's what it's all about, would you agree? It's about the relationship and how to close more sales. But we learned here, it's all about having the right process in place. Let me explain what I mean by that. You all see what this is right here? What is this? Three by five. Three by five card. Would you all agree this card here is smaller than my face, right? Yes. So we pretty tough got a hole in it large enough to put my face through. Would you agree? If you have the right process in place, take the variable of the customer, put it in your process, along with the right tools, and more importantly, 
the right process, that you practice enough so that you can execute the fundamentals under pressure. We have 50 people watching, so hopefully if I follow my process correctly, I can come up with a predictable conclusion. And in this case, what's my predictable conclusion? A three by five card. They folded it. Large number, my base three. Give me a new. Give me a hop. How was I able to do this? I have the right tools. I also have the right process. But did I need to practice that a few times? Why did I need to practice that so much? So I can execute a win. So we believe that it's all about communication. What our three organization does, all we do is help improve the performance of sales and customer service teams. And what's that frontline employee, whether it's a salesperson, customer service person, billing person, tech person, how are they communicating to that customer? That's the first conversation we live in. Second conversation we live in is how is that frontline manager, how are they coaching that frontline employee to be better on the very, very next interaction? What we know is that most organizations underestimate by a thousand volt the energy, the effort, more importantly, the amount of price it takes to become a great communicator. Now, I'm a professional speaker. I do this all the time. You know, I was just in Nashville earlier this week, speaking, I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa yesterday. So sorry. All right, thank you much. <laughs> but does that, that thing ever happen with, like, I was practicing this video. I came in a little bit early after lunch. I was rehearsing in my mind what I was gonna say. If you're experienced, you think you're gonna say what you actually say or what? They're totally different things. That's why I think it's so important that you have to actually practice what you're going to say. But it comes down to change. Do we usually do what's best for us, or do we usually do what's most comfortable? We all know that a diet filled with lots of leafy green vegetables, a little bit of protein, not too much sugar, cakes, chocolate candy. We all know what's right to Would you agree? How many of us know we eat? Joy, we have a stuff. We know it's not good for us recently, but dessert today. How many cannot wait to have a couple cocktails tonight? Do we usually do what's best for us, or do we usually do what's most comfortable? We just test that theory real quick. Come here. Just, just cross your arms. Just cross your arms real quick. Just cross your arms. Now, take a look. Are you right hand over left or left hand over right? I got my left or right. Just do me a favor. Just switch it. Please. How many of you want, Ron, went right back the way you were? All right. Is change hard? That's really what we do. So that our clients, Google, YouTube, Hotels.com, Expedia, Time Warner, MetLife, Caterpillar, what we do is we help them take anywhere from two people to 2,000 people and communicate more effectively, but really change their habits and their process. When it comes down to coaching, there's a couple of things I want you guys to be thinking about. Number one rule of a great leader is get people to do more things right, not less things wrong. Now, my daughter, Carla, there she is, she's nine years old, she's playing soccer. And Shawnee starts coaching. The entire first half, Shawnee is running up and down the sideline, screaming at the girls. My daughter's playing defense. Stop kicking the ball in the middle. Quick, kicking the ball in the middle. And word of the girls keep kicking the ball, too. And so the rep blows the whistle for halftime. I'm like, shh. I'm like, Carly, get over here, Carly. I'm like, Carly, are you not listening to your coach? And she looks up at me with her nine year old wife. Like, yeah, Dad. Well, where's she kicking Tell me to kick the ball, too. She said, Dad, she keeps, she keeps telling me to kick the ball. No, go kick the ball in the middle. Why are you doing that? And she looks at me and she says, well, Dad, where am I supposed to get the ball to? But Shawnee, get her, Shawnee. Shawnee, you keep screaming at the girls, stop kicking the ball in the middle. And she's like, I know, and they keep doing that. Well, where do you want them to kick the ball to? Up the sideline. Then tell them that. How often do we spend our time telling people what not to do versus what we want them to do? They were surprised they're not doing what we want them to do. So rule number one, get people to do more things right, not less things wrong. Number two is quit coaching the past and start affecting the future. So Ron and I just want to sell spot, don't be wrong. Yes. Absolutely. And we get back in the car, I'm Ron's manager. When we get back in the car, what's the first question most managers ask their salesperson about the sales call they just went on? How'd it go? How'd it go? And Ron says? Awesome. What well, awesome. Then I, the manager, the coach, what do we usually say? Well, not so much. Yeah, pretty good, but Ron, not so much. How can I talk about our new product or services that we have? And Ron says, how can you come up with a new product or service? Talk about a new product and service that we have. Uh, don't have it. All right. Usually, Ron will say, well, I did, GA. I'm like, no, you didn't. He says, yes, I did. And I'll say, well, I recorded it. No, you didn't. All right. But how often, though, do we try to get people to change what happened in the past? Can you change the past? It's almost irrelevant what happened in the past. 
key is, what are you going to do to affect the future? So instead of saying, hey, Ron, how did you did or didn't do this in the past, how can I get Ron excited about doing something in the future? Because here's the thing. People, they get defensive about the past. They get excited about the future. If you're in sales, kind of old school sales, says find their pain point, rub them salt in it, and they will move forward. We teach new school sales. It's not about finding the pain point. It's about, because what you know, pain causes, pain causes paralysis. Excitement causes movement. How many of you are working on a deal with a client or a prospect right now, and you know for a fact that they should move forward, it totally can help their business, and they still are on the fence? Because what we find is that pain doesn't, pain causes paralysis. People get nervous about pain, and they may not like it, but they haven't lost their job yet. And they think by change, something could get worse. So it's how do you get them excited though, about what can happen in the future? So we really call that kind of coaching forward. What do you need to do, and how do you coach through the front windshield versus the rear view mirror? Number three is really giving people the what and the why. What you're doing and why you're doing it. Now, how many here have small teenage children or once was a teenager? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my daughter, Alicia, she's 17 years old. She gets home from school. The first thing she does is she goes to the bottom of my stairs, and she takes off her shoes. What happens after three or four days at the bottom of my stairs? So what do I say, what do I say to her? Pick up your shoes. Pick up your shoes, and her being the 17 year old daughter with just a little bit of attitude, how does she respond? She doesn't do it. Exactly, and she doesn't do it, does she? So what do I do a little bit later? Carly, or Alicia, pick up your shoes, and her first question is? Why? Because I said so. All right, and she takes the shoes up, stomps up the stairs, goes to her window, or go over her room, shoves in the shoes, slams the door, or I give her the what and the why. Let her know what I wanted to do and why I want her to do it. Hey, Alicia, you know that I blew my knee out skiing this past winter. You can't get me to trip over your shoes and grip any one shoe. Just take them up and put it in your room. How does she respond to that? Sure, Daddy. All right. Let people know the what and the why. And here's the thing, too. With the lack of the what and the why, people go to the worst case scenario. Think about it, I just worked with Nevada State Bank over in Nevada, and they have 24 branches they were closing. They are a 49 branch bank. They are closing 24. What did the entire company start working on? The resume. The resume, did that the company is going out of business. So I talked to Dallas on the president, like Dallas, everybody's nervous about working when you guys went out of business. He's like, well, gee, we're not going out of business at all. But what were the business reasons? And he said, well, here's what's going on. Of the 24 stores we're closing, those are all in-store market branches. They're in a market. And of the 24, 22 have a brick and mortar store in the parking lot. And they're raising our rent almost two times. Because I don't think it was a good business decision to raise our rent and have two branches right next to each other. So I decided to close those branches. So we made him go out and he was doing town halls and explaining the what and the why. And afterwards, people had to come up and thanking him for making that decision. Why were they thanking him? It's good business, wasn't it? But without the what and the why, where do people go? We do a lot of research on this. They go to the worst case scenario. So again, get people to do more things right, not less things wrong. Let them know, sorry, affecting the future, not the past. And get people to do more things right, not less things wrong, and let them know the what and the why. It's all about belief systems here. You guys remember Roger Bannister? You know who Roger Bannister was? Yeah. Who was Roger Bannister? First person to direct the foreman of all, right? Any idea when he did that? Close, 1954. It was believed at that time, physically impossible to run the mile under four minutes. Your heart had to beat so fast. Boom, 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 boom. Then it literally explode. But Roger Bannister, being a medical student and a runner, on May 13th, 1954, went and ran the mile three minutes and 59.4 seconds. Now his heart's beating. Boom, 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 boom. But did it explode? No, it didn't. Well, actually, it did. No. That would not be concerned with it. See, his heart did not explode. But here's the thing, too. How long do you think he held his world record for? Two months? Two years? It was actually four days. He did it four days later, somebody else beat his world record. At the end of that month, 11 of the people had read the mile in under four minutes. End of that year, 237 people. Today, it's 3,000 different people. My God, you and I are on them, are we? Run the mile in under four minutes. Mike, I need your help real quick. You need to come up here. You need some time. All right, Mike just got a ball and told to help out here. Come up here, my friend. <laughs> All right. 
You see the stuff is right here? Yes. Okay. What type of tape is this? This is nylon reinforced strapping tape. This is pretty strong stuff. Grab a piece of tape right there. Grab it right there. Do you think you can just take that tape and just bust apart the very hands just like this? Do you think you can do that? Probably not. All right, so let me ask you this. Mike, can you break nylon reinforced strapping with your bare hands? No. Would you all agree that's his belief system there? Yes. We're gonna see if we can change his belief system here in under two minutes. Take that piece of tape right there. Myself. All right, here's what you do. Take a, I'll put a sticky side on. Put your eight fingers in the middle there, just like I have it there. And I'll wave to everybody. That's just to make it look silly. I'll put your fingers towards yourself, push the tape up, and then crease it to stick it to itself. Good. Now take your left hand, put your left hand off just like I have it here. But put it back a little bit farther. Put the tape back a little bit farther. Uh oh. <laughs> There it is. All right. Now close your fingers on the tape. Here. Close your fingers on. Get your thumb, but your thumb over the line. Like that. Great. Take your other hand. Wipe it off. Grab the other side of the tape here. Put your knuckles together like that. Here. Put up your chin and that's the part. <laughs> Mike. Yes. Can you break nylon reinforced strapping with your bare hands? I can. What just happened to this belief system there in under two minutes? How are you? Well, appreciation. Nice to meet you. How was I able to change his belief system? I gave the right process. I had a demonstrated form. For the rest of your life, if anyone was ever asked you, can you break nylon reinforced strapping with your bare hands with enthusiasm, they're going to say, absolutely. Right? That's what it's all about, about having the right process in place. But more importantly, is your leaders, are they coaching effectively? If right now you're gonna to listen to your team on the phone or face-to-face, -face, would you like what you're hearing? Again, most people, the organization we work with, by 8,000 more underestimate the time, the energy, effort it takes to become a great communicator. They don't have the right process in place and they don't have the direct coaching in place. And so with that, I just wanna say, challenge you to step out of your comfort zone and do something a little bit different. So on behalf of Sage, myself, Stacy, my vice president, say guys, thank you very much.